While at Watertown, I married and afterwards removed to Menden, Monroe County, New York. At this place I had a remarkable dream or vision. I fancied that I died. In a moment I was out of the body, and fully conscious that I had made the change. At once a heavenly messenger or guide was by me. I thought and acted as naturally as I had done in the body, and all my sensations seemed as complete without as with it. The personage with me was dressed in the purest white. For a short time I remained in the room where my body lay. My sister Fanny, who was living with me when I had this dream, and my wife were weeping bitterly over my death. I sympathized with them deeply in their sorrow and desired to comfort them. I realized that I was under the control of the man who was by me. I begged of him the privilege of speaking to them, but he said he could not grant it. My guide, for so I will call him, said, Now let us go. Space seemed annihilated. Apparently we went up and almost instantly were in another world. It was of such a magnitude that I formed no conception of its size. It was filled with innumerable host of beings, who seemed as naturally human as those among whom I had lived. With some I had been acquainted in the world I had just left. My guide informed me that those I had saw had not yet arrived at their final abiding place. All kinds of people seemed mixed up promiscuously, as they are in this world. Their surroundings and manner indicated that they were in a state of expectation and awaiting some event of considerable moment to them. As we went on from this place, my guide said, I will now show you the condition of the damned. Pointing with his hand, he said, Look. And I looked down a distance which appeared incomprehensible to me. I gazed on a vast region filled with multitudes of beings. I could see everything with the most minute distinctness. The multitude of people I saw were miserable in the extreme. These, said my guide, are they who have rejected the means of salvation that were placed within their reach and have brought upon themselves the condemnation you behold. The expression of the countenances of these sufferers was clear and distinct. They indicated extreme remorse, sorrow, and dejection. They appeared conscious that none but themselves were to blame for their forlorn condition. This scene affected me much, and I could not refrain from weeping. Again my guide said, Now let us go. In a moment we were at the gate of a beautiful city. A porter opened it, and we passed in. The city was grand and beautiful beyond anything that I can describe. It was clothed in the purest light, brilliant, but not glaring or unpleasant. The people, men and women, in their employments and surroundings, seemed contented and happy. I knew those I met without being told who they were. I saw and spoke with the Apostle Paul. My guide would not permit me to pause much by the way but rather hurried me on through this place to another still higher, but connected with it. It was still more beautiful and glorious than anything I had before seen. To me, its extent and magnificence were incomprehensible. My guide pointed to a mansion which excelled everything else in perfection and beauty. It was clothed with fire and intense light. It appeared a fountain of light, throwing brilliant scintillations of glory all around it, and I could conceive of no limit to which these emanations extended. Said my guide, That is where God resides. 
He permitted me to enter this glorious city but a short distance. Without speaking, he motioned that we would retrace our steps. We were soon in the adjoining city. There I met my mother and a sister who died when six or seven years old. These I knew at sight without an introduction. After mingling with the pure and happy beings of this place a short time, my guide again said, Let us go. We were soon through the gate by which we had entered the city. My guide then said, Now we will return. I could distinctly see the world from which we had first come. It appeared to be a vast distance below us. To me, it looked cloudy, dreary, and dark. I was filled with sad disappointment. I might say horror at the idea of returning there. I supposed I had come to stay in that heavenly place, which I had so long desired to see. Up to this time, the thought had not occurred to me that I would be required to return. I pled with my guide to let me remain. He replied that I was permitted only to visit these heavenly cities, for I had not filled my mission in yonder world. Therefore I must return and take my body. If I was faithful to the grace of God which would be imparted to me, if I would bear a faithful testimony to the inhabitants of the earth of a sacrificed and risen Savior and His atonement for man, in a little time I should be permitted to return and remain. These words gave me comfort and inspired my bosom with the principle of faith. To me these things were real. I felt that a great mission had been given me, and I accepted it in my heart. The responsibility of that mission had rested upon me from that time until now. We returned to my house. There I found my body, and it appeared to me dressed for burial. It was with great reluctance that I took possession of it to resume the ordinary avocations of life and endeavor to fill the important mission I had received. I awoke and found myself lying in my bed. I lay and meditated the remainder of the night on what had been shown me. Call it a dream or vision or what I may, what I saw was real to every sense of my being as anything I have passed through. The memory of it is clear and distinct with me today, after the lapse of fifty years with its many changes. From that time, although belonging to no church, the Spirit was with me to testify to the sufferings and atonement of the Savior. As I had opportunity, I continually exhorted the people, in public and private, to exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins and live a life of righteousness and of good works. In the fall of 1828, I returned to Hector Schuyler County, New York. Quite a number of people lived there of the Campbellite faith. Squire Chase, a prominent man in the neighborhood, who had been a preacher of the sect, said they were cold in religion and had not held any meeting for several months. I had been there but a few days when I went with him about two miles to a Methodist meeting. Up to this time I had joined an old church. Although I had professed religion, attended meetings, and preached when I had an opportunity. On my return, I remarked to Mr. Chase, Why cannot we have meetings in our neighborhood as well as to go so far to them? He replied, We are all dead there. We would have meetings, but I do not feel like preaching. I will appoint a meeting. He did so. The first two meetings, but few attended. The third meeting, the house was crowded. Finally, meetings were held nearly every night of the week and were well attended. A reformation started among the people, and there were quite a number of religious converts. Campbellite principles had long prevailed in the neighborhood. The converts desired baptism, as that was a prominent principle in the Campbellite faith. 
Mr. Chase urged me to perform the ordinance. I excused myself, telling him that I had never joined any religious denomination and did not feel authorized to administer it. I finally utterly refused to do so. He then sent 40 or 50 miles for Elder Brown, a regular Campbellite preacher. He came and baptized about 60 converts and organized a branch of the Campbellite church out of the fruits of my labors. He quite exhausted his persuasive powers to induce me to join this Campbellite church, to take a circuit and go preaching. I told him that I would not preach his doctrines. If I preached at all, I would preach the whole Bible as I understood it. He said I could do so, for he did not think I would preach anything wrong. A spirit worked with me to do all the good I could, but not to join any religious denomination. It prevailed within me all temptation this time. Perhaps the guardian angel promised by my mother watched over my spiritual as well as my temporal welfare. I think at the time of this reformation, I had as much of the spirit of the Lord with me as I could well enjoy in my ignorance of the gospel and its purity. I was full of the testimony of the truth as I understood it. This reformation in Hector was a means of temptation to me. I had preached and labored with my might to lead the people to the truth, and Elder Brown had stepped in and reaped the results of my labors. Because I would not join the Campbellite church and preach for them, I was entirely thrown aside. The adversary would reason with me thus, What is the use to all your preaching? It does not amount anything to you. You had better attend to your own business and let such nonsense alone. I listened to these suggestions until I had grieved the Spirit of the Lord, which I had enjoyed. I no longer had the Spirit to pray or to exhort the people to lives of righteousness. I was in this condition for several months. In all this lethargy and darkness, I knew there was such a thing as joy in the Spirit of God, that in the testimony of Jesus there was light and peace. I knew I had accepted a mission to bear this testimony, while I should remain on the earth. Knowing these things, I became in time alarmed at my condition. I feared the Lord had forsaken me. I humbled myself before him in fasting and prayer. I promised him that if he would return his good spirit, I would never again reject its suggestions. Matters continued thus with me for several weeks. In one of my seasons of prayer and supplication, I sensibly felt that I was again visited by the Holy Spirit. I was encouraged to resume my labors in exhorting the people whenever an opportunity was presented. I went from home on the Sabbath and held meetings in different places. I was employed in this way when I first saw the Book of Mormon and when the gospel was preached to me. This and other experiences have convinced me that when we question the Holy Spirit, it is likely to be grieved and leave us to ourselves. Then will our darkness be greater than if we had never enjoyed its influences. Perhaps this incident in my life may suggest wisdom to others. In November 1829, I removed to a place called Hector Hill. In February 1831, my father and brothers Joseph and Brigham and Heber C. Kimball came to my house. They brought with them the Book of Mormon. They were on their way to visit some saints in Pennsylvania. Through fear of being deceived, I was quite cautious in religious matters. I read and compared the Book of Mormon with the Bible, and fasted and prayed that I might come to a knowledge of the truth. The Spirit seemed to say, This is the way, walk ye in it. This was all the testimony I could get at the time. It was not altogether satisfactory. The following May, Elder Levi Gifford came into the neighborhood and desired to preach. My brother John belonged to the Methodist Church 
and had charge of their meeting house, which was in the neighborhood. I obtained from him permission for Elder Gifford to preach in it. The appointment was circulated for a meeting the same evening. This was on a Saturday evening, and a circuit preacher of that district was to hold a meeting there on a Sunday. Elder Midbury, the circuit preacher, attended the meeting. The house was crowded. As soon as Elder Gifford had concluded his discourse, Elder Midbury arose to his feet and said, Brethren and sisters and friends, I have been a preacher of the gospel for 22 years. I do not know that I have been the means of converting a sinner or reclaiming a poor backslider. But this I do know, that the doctrine the stranger has preached to us tonight is a deception, and that Joe Smith is a false prophet, and that the Book of Mormon is from hell. After talking a while on this strain, he concluded, I immediately rose to my feet and asked the privilege of speaking, which was granted. I said that Elder Midbury, in his remarks, entirely ignored the possibility of more revelation, and acknowledged that he had been a preacher of the gospel for 22 years, without knowing that he had been the means of converting a sinner or of reclaiming a poor backslider. But still he claimed to know that the doctrine he had just heard was false, that Joseph Smith was an impostor, and that the Book of Mormon was from hell. Now, how is it possible, I asked, for him to know these things unless he has received a revelation? When I sat down, a strong man by the name of Thompson, who was well known in the neighborhood as a belligerent character, stepped up to Elder Gifford and demanded proofs of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Elder Gifford replied, I have said all I care about saying tonight. Then said Mr. Thompson, We will take the privilege of clothing you with a coat of tar and feathers and riding you out of town on a rail. In the meantime, four or five others of like character came to the front. Acting under the impulse of the moment, true to the instincts of my nature to protect the weak against the strong, I stepped between Elder Gifford and Mr. Thompson. Looking the latter in the eye, I said, Mr. Thompson, you cannot lay your hand on this stranger to harm a hair of his head. Without you do it over my dead body. He replied by mere threats of violence, which brought my brother John to his feet. With a voice and a manner that carried with it a power greater than I had ever seen manifested in him before, and I might say since, he commanded Mr. Thompson and party to take their seats. He continued, Gentlemen, if you lay a hand on Mr. Gifford, you shall pass through my hands, after which I think you will not want any more tonight. Mr. Thompson and party quieted down and then took their seats. Since then, the elders have passed through so many similar experiences that they have ceased to be a novelty. That there should be such a powerful antagonism of spirits manifesting themselves in muscle in a Christian church indicated a new era in religious influences. In the spring of 1831, there was two days of meetings of the saints, about six miles from where I lived in the state of Pennsylvania. I attended it and became fully convinced of the divine origin of the Latter-day work. <laughs>